Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 69 in the series on the Fungal Kingdom. In the previous episodes, I explored the general history of fungal evolution and diversification, and then I went into greater detail on the earliest fungi, like the Microsporidia, the Chytrids, and the Zygosporangia. Now this brings us to the middle of the fungal family tree, where we see the divergence and emergence of a humble clade called the Glomeromycota. The Glomeromycota will be the subject of today's episode. And this is a clade that's relatively small. There's only 230 species that have been described in the scientific literature, and most of them are hypogeous, which means that they live under the surface of the soil, embedded in the dirt. Although this might make the Glomeromycota seem like a small, modest, humble clade, or even boring at first glance, their evolutionary niche and their ecological role are hugely important. You could even say that they are foundational to many of the Earth's ecosystems, and as I get on with the episode, you will quickly see why. The defining feature of the Glomeromycota clade are the symbioses that they form with plants and their roots. The Glomeromycota form structures that grow around and in into the plant's root tissue, and these are called arbuscular mycorrhizas. The symbiosis is a complex, highly evolved process, wherein the fungal hyphae penetrate the plant's cell walls, reaching into the cell to grow a nodule of tissue that's designed for nutrient exchange. The plant symbiont can give the fungal symbiont some of its sugar, the, the sugar that it produced from photosynthesis, and in return, the fungal symbiont can give the plant mineral nutrients, and nitrogenous compounds, and water, and all sorts of other valuable stuff that it's extracted from the soil. This is a hugely important symbiosis, and almost every glomeromycota forms them. There are, however, a very small handful of species that have not been observed forming arbuscular mycorrhizas, and out of the entire clade, only a single species is known for a fact to not form them. This species is the Geosiphon pyriformis, but I'll get into more detail on this later. Now, before this episode is over, I'll have touched on a lot of the interesting topics, like the evolution of the diverse groups in the Glomeromycota clade, how the Glomeromycota reproduce, how they grow and spread across geographic space, you know, all that good stuff. But first, I want to dig in a little deeper into the arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis. You know, it just, it's so important. And I really want to explore this aspect of glomeromycota life before we go on to anything else. Because this really is the central, defining, super important feature of the clade, is their symbioses. The ecological niche of this fungal symbiont is rich with opportunity, thanks to the wide diversity of plant species and the habitats that sustain them. The glomeromycota have dominated this ecological niche for many hundreds of millions of years, growing in the soils of hot deserts and cold deserts, in salt marshes, in riparian zones and wetlands, and in the great coniferous and broadleaf forests that carpet the world. This arbuscular symbiosis evolved about 460 million years ago, which goes to show you just how old this relationship is. It's so old that the land plants were still a relatively young lineage, and those early vegetable ancestors that evolved this symbiosis shared that trait with all of their diversifying descendants. This capacity to form the symbioses with these glomeromycota fungi has been carried across the eons to be spread throughout the genes of almost all vascular land plants. By about 400 million years ago, we start to see structures that look like modern arbuscular mycorrhizas. Now, mycologists aren't exactly sure how this relationship first evolved, but they have concluded that the initial relationship involved the fungi taking nutrients from the plant. But over time, this relationship evolved into a more equitable exchange, where the symbiotes shared nutrients to each other's benefit. Because the fungal hyphae are finer and more mobile in the soil than the plant's roots, they are more effective at finding and absorbing mineral nutrients and water. 
The fungi will then share some of these nutrients with the plant, which means that the plant is getting more of these mineral nutrients than it would be able to if there wasn't any symbiotic fungi attached to the roots at all. In this way, the plant fungal symbiosis helped the vascular plants to colonize dry land and all of the varied habitats thereupon. These fungi were especially helpful for the plants that colonized nutrient-poor soils, but they tend to be less common in areas with very nutrient-rich soil. In areas with very rich soil, you don't really need a fungal symbiote to help you extract all of the, the mineral resources. But if, you, if you're a plant and you live in an area that has nutrient-poor soil, it really is a huge benefit to, to your fitness and your, your health and your ability to reproduce if you can work alongside some fungus to give them sugar in return for them giving you water and more mineral, mineral nutrients. That'll make it easier for you, the plant, to survive in this otherwise harsh and unforgiving terrestrial habitat. We can say for certain that without this arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis, without these glomeromycota, it's almost certain that we would not have anything close to the extensive vegetation that we see on the world today. All right, moving on, glomeromycota reproduction is asexual and relatively straightforward, which is somewhat anomalous for the fungi, which usually have species that can reproduce asexually and or sexually, and even then there's a lot of variation there. But with the glomeromycota, it's entirely asexual and relatively simple compared to other fungi. At the tip of a glomeromycota hyphal filament, the last cell on the end of the hyphae will undergo a special kind of transformation. It'll start to produce large spores, with multiple nuclei encased within a thick wall. And these large spores, these glomerospores, will be washed through the soil when it rains. Some species can send their spores through the air, but these are a minority. Anyway, when the glomerospore winds up in some place that's suitable, based on various chemical and environmental signals, they will germinate. An environmental signal would be something like the temperature or the humidity, while a chemical signal would be something like the pH or nutrient concentrations or the presence of root exudates, which are chemicals given off by plant roots as they grow through the soil. The glomerospore will detect these root exudates, which indicates that a potential plant host is nearby, and so this will encourage germination. When the glomerospore germinates, it begins producing a new mycelia, replete with squirming masses of hyphae. These hyphae will all grow outwards, creeping through the soil as they follow various chemical cues. The hyphae sense the concentration of these chemicals, of these root exudates, and this gives them a kind of orientation relative to the host plant. So if the root produces root exudates, like strigolactones, then those chemicals will be at the highest concentration gradient nearest the plant. If the hyphae swims up the concentration gradient, so to speak, or I guess if it, if it crawls up the concentration gradient, it will soon come to the roots. Conversely, the roots are actively absorbing nutrients, and so nutrients will be in a lower concentration immediately near the roots. For example, the hyphae won't grow in areas with heavy phosphorus concentrations as this suggests that there aren't that many plant roots around that are absorbing the phosphorus. Instead, the hyphae will crawl down the concentration gradient of the phosphorus, so to speak, so that the hyphae will grow towards areas with low phosphorus concentration, as this would presumably lead them to a root, a root which is actively absorbing phosphorus. Once the branching hyphae comes into contact with the plant's roots, two things can happen but it depends on what the hyphae finds first. If the hyphae comes into contact with a root hair, then the hyphae will burrow into the root hair, and it will grow down the root hair into the root's cortex. If the hyphae just runs into the root itself, it'll press against the epidermal cells and initiate the growth of a structure called an apressorium, or an infection structure. The apressorium is essentially a growth that the fungus uses to break its way into the plant cells. It forms on the root's epidermis, and then works its way into the parenchyma, or the cortex. Or, in less technical terms, it works its way into the soft, inner vascular tissue of the root itself. 
The fungus has to break through the structural tissue to get to this functional tissue, where the nutrients are, and where nutrient exchange can happen. The hyphae will reach into the parenchyma and begin drilling through the walls of the cells. The hyphae will penetrate the cell wall, but it actually won't poke through the plasma membrane inside. Instead, the hyphae will push against the plant cell's plasma membrane, and as the hyphae grows and branches wildly, the plasma membrane will not be penetrated, but it will instead wrap around the hyphae, like a cloak or a full-body swimsuit. This will increase the surface area where plant cell membrane is pressed against fungal cell membrane, and this will increase the surface area available for nutrient exchange between the two organisms. That's the whole point of all of this branching that goes on inside the cell. The hyphae is essentially creating a fluffy nodule of absorptive tissue, called an arbuscule, which will act as a site of nutrient exchange between the two organisms. This arbuscule is really soft and delicate, and it'll dissolve after a short period of time, with its biomass being absorbed by the plant cell. New arbuscules will be generated in other cells, and the symbiosis as a whole is perpetuated, even though each individual arbuscule is relatively soft and short-lived. The fungus will grow an arbuscule. It'll help the fungus absorb sugars from the plant while sharing phosphorus and other mineral nutrients and nitrogenous compounds with the plant. And then, after some time, the arbuscule will dissolve in a final burst of nutrients for the plant, before more arbuscules are generated somewhere else in other cells. In this way, the symbiosis isn't a static, unmoving thing. It's a fluid and dynamic biological integration that's in a constant, pulsing flux based on the growth and dissolution of these arbuscules. This symbiosis as a whole is called an arbuscular mycorrhiza because it's these arbuscules that are the, the basis of the whole symbiosis. And believe it or not, it's actually the plant that controls the growth of these branching hyphal nodules inside its cells. The plant expresses a package of genes designed to accommodate this symbiosis and make room for the arbuscule to grow. This genetic activity shrinks the organelles, it shrinks the vacuole, and it even reorganizes the cell's cytoskeleton so as to make more space available within the cell for this growing fungal tissue. Similarly, the root exudates that have attracted the hyphae will initiate genes related to metabolism in the fledgling fungus spore. Remember that these hyphae have all grown out of this germinating glomerospore, and that spore is still there. It's still alive, using its reserves of chemical energy to fuel the exploratory growth of its hyphae. One or more of these probing limbs will come into contact with the plant root and smell the exudates. This will trigger genetic activity in the hyphal limb, which begins to prepare it for the symbiosis. A signal will be sent to the spore that increases the spore's metabolic rate. Essentially, it's found a target root. It's found a root that it can colonize and form a symbiosis with. And so now, it will heavily invest resources into growing that particular limb to initiate that symbiosis. The fungus's biomass will shift in a fluid-like pattern within the soil to concentrate near the discovered roots. And in this way, the physical symbiosis will be formed. Once the fungus has established itself inside the plant's roots, a certain type of hyphae can grow back out of the root back into the soil. Compared to the root hairs that grow out of the plant root, these hyperfine hyphae are much better at absorbing minerals and other nutrients. And because they're so thin, they can enter pores and tight spaces in the soil, even in between the grains of a rock. They can go places that are too narrow or too small for the larger, clumsier roots of a plant. Another type of hyphae grows out of the plant's roots and seeks out other plant roots to colonize. These hyphae can connect multiple plants together into a larger mycelial network so that the fungus and all of the plants that it's connected to can all share nutrients. The sugar produced by one plant can be shared with another plant by using these connecting fungal hyphae as a travel corridor. Of course, the fungus itself needs some of this sugar too. The glomeromycota are obligate symbionts, which means that they struggle to get all of the nutrients they need on their own. They need a plant host, just like how the vascular plants tend to need their fungal symbiotes 
to colonize and thrive in an otherwise harsh environment. The fungus absorbs hexose sugars from the plant, which it then metabolizes into more immediately useful products like glucose, which it uses to store energy, or pentose, which it uses to build nucleic acids, so it can create more DNA and RNA. In return for all of this sugar, the fungus will give the plant all of the nutrients that it's better at extracting from the soil, for example, phosphorus. When the plant invests a lot of sugar in its fungal symbiont, the fungus can return the favor by supplying a lot of phosphorus and other mineral nutrients. If a plant is stingy with its sugar and doesn't give that much to the fungus, the fungus will be just as stingy with its phosphorus supply. Some of these fungi tend to lean towards parasitism, in the sense that the host plants might give them a lot of sugar and they'll invest in the symbiosis, but the fungus will give back a disproportionately low amount of phosphorus. The fungus will basically sap the plant of its precious sugar, while giving a token amount of phosphorus back in return, basically just enough to skate by and keep the plant from dying. After all, parasites can put themselves at risk if they kill their host without having a backup host ready nearby. I should clarify that this kind of soft parasitism isn't really characteristic of the entire clade. The vast majority of these arbuscular mycorrhizas are mutualistic, where both parties, the plant and the fungus, benefit. The symbiosis is so beneficial that it's allowed plants to colonize otherwise hostile and low-nutrient habitats that they would never have a chance to have colonized without them, without the fungus. The glomeromycota have helped the vascular plants to colonize deserts and arid plains regions and volcanic soil like the Hawaiian Islands and Iceland. They are particularly common in the tropical and subtropical forests, where the humidity, the temperature, and the seasonal climate stability create extremely fertile growing conditions. Counterintuitively, soils in these fertile landscapes are often thin, and they can be nutrient-poor, because there's so many organisms feeding from it, feeding from this thin layer of soil. A lot of organisms are also dying and decaying back into the soil, but they decay so fast and their nutrients get taken up so fast that the soil itself, as a matrix independent of the plants and other things growing on it, the soil itself isn't particularly replenished. Everything that goes into it gets taken back out so quickly. Here, the glomeromycota are invaluable, as they, they're not only able to assist the plants, they can actually create vast hyphal networks connecting many plants together. This ensures that nutrients can be supplied to some degree or another to as many plants as possible, and this benefits the entire habitat and the whole ecology. Almost 80% of plant species can form these arbuscular mycorrhizal symbioses. This tends to happen when the symbiosis is more than 460 million years old and may have been foundational to the evolution of the land plants, to emerge from the ocean and actually live on land. We can literally see glomeromycot fungus and their arbuscular mycorrhizas in the fossil record. The prototaxites, which are some of the earliest tree-like organisms to live on land, are believed to have been a kind of fungal-algal symbiote, essentially making these prototaxites a giant lichen. And the fungus component is believed to have been a glomeromycota species. These prototaxites grow to be quite large, with trunks about a meter wide, and a height topping out at around 8 meters. Perhaps the reason they were able to grow so large, relative to other simple plants that existed at the time, was because of this symbiotic nature. This improved access to nutrients is evident in their large size. There's very few plant species that actually don't form arbuscular mycorrhizas. These typically belong to the Brassicaceae family, or the mustard family, which includes stuff like cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, radish, thalecress, and of course, mustard. Unfortunately, this family includes many plants that are model organisms, including plants in the Brassica genus and the Arabidopsis genus. The reason that this is unfortunate, I mean, the reason that it's, it's kind of frustrating and unfortunate that these uh, Brassicaceae family plants don't form arbuscular mycorrhizas with the glomeromycota fungi is because 
without these model organisms, researchers have to study arbuscular mycorrhizas with other plant species. And these other plant species might grow slowly, or they might not grow as well in lab conditions. And because we can't really use our go-to model plant organisms to, to study these glomeromycota, it just, it just makes it that much harder to study them. All right, so remember that one species out of the entire glomeromycota clade that's known to not form arbuscular mycorrhizas? That's the Geosiphon pyriformis. And instead of arbuscular mycorrhizas, it forms a symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria of the genus Nostoc, usually the species Nostoc punctiforma. For this reason, the Geosiphon pyriformis was initially called a lichen, as it's incorporated these photosynthetic bacterium into its mycelia. But that's actually not technically accurate, as the symbiosis is intracellular. The cyanobacteria are completely enveloped within the fungus. In this case, the geosiphon pyriformis is less of a lichen and more like a fungus that's trying to pretend to be a plant by absorbing photosynthetic microbes to generate sugars internally. Within the clade glomeromycota, there are four orders. The oldest, and the first to diverge, are the paraglomerules. These are pretty simple fungi. They have transparent spores, they don't usually produce vesicles to store nutrients or waste products, and under a microscope, these uh, paraglomerules are simple and yellowish, or transparent, with their spherical spores being grown on the end of thin hyphal filaments. Diverging next are the archaeosporales. Fossil evidence from South Africa suggests that this lineage, these archaeosporales, emerged as, or at least they were included in an early lineage that was, free living. These fossils are over 2 billion years old, so this really was in the fungal clade's earliest days, when the fungi were still single cells. Among the early archaeosporales diverging from these free living populations was the geosiphon pyriformis, which I talked about just a, a few minutes ago. The remaining branch would split once more, to produce the diversosporales and the glomerules. The diversosporales, as the name would suggest, produce a diverse variety of spores. Their hyphal cells can be larger or more globular than other glomeromycot fungi, as they often possess large vesicles full of sugars. The glomeruleles don't really have a wide variety of spores, but they do produce huge spores, like really big. Even though the glomeruli spores are single cells, they can be anywhere from 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters wide. Now, half a millimeter might not seem very large to you, especially not a tenth of a millimeter, but on a cellular scale, when you're talking about single cells, that's really big. Also, while most glomeromycota are asexual, within the glomerulis, there's a genus called the glomus, and some of the species in this genus are believed to reproduce sexually, even though it hasn't been directly observed. Apparently, these glomus species have all of the genes that are necessary for meiosis, as well as genes associated with mating types and other fungi, and genes associated with the chemical pathways involved in sensing pheromones. So all of the genetic evidence is there, building the case that somewhere within the glomerulis, there's at least one or two sexually reproducing species. The only confounding factor here is that we've never actually observed sexual reproduction in these species. And, I mean, that's kind of a big deal. You have all this evidence, but if you've never actually seen something happen, then you can only infer. Because of this stubborn mystery, the reproductive cycle of these glomus species is called cryptic. They're cryptofungi. Now, all of these glomeromycot fungi are pretty similar, morphologically speaking. Under a microscope, virtually all of them are mostly transparent. The hyphae in their mycelium look like wriggling tubes in a huge clump, devoid of septas. A septa is a porous wall structure that some fungi have between the cells in their hyphae, isolating each nucleus within a little discrete region of the hyphae. The glomeromycota, by and large, don't have these septa, which means that their mycelia is senacidic. Instead of having hyphae composed of discrete cells lined up end-to-end, -end, 
The cells in these senocytic fungi don't have clear divisions. Their membranes are often interlinked or conjoined, to the point where the glomeromycote is essentially a giant, single supercell with an absolutely massive surface area due to this highly filamentous branching morphology. The most distinguishing feature is the spore, which is produced at the end of a hyphae, or at a regular interval along a hyphae. These spores are large, globular, or spherical masses, and they give the mycelia a studded texture. This is the body form that creeps through the soil, sniffing out the roots of a plant. Now, normally, I would go into more detail on each group, but unfortunately for all of us, not much is really known about them. I mean, some general stuff is known, like how most of them are hypogeous, which means they live mostly or entirely underground, but a lot of stuff just isn't known. It's a mystery. The glomeromycota as a clade were only recognized as being independent from the zygomycota within the last two decades or so, and the four orders within the glomeromycota have only been properly organized through genetic analysis in the last decade. Morphologically, they're all really similar. Now their spores are where the real variation comes in, but every other difference exists on a microscopic or a molecular scale, and we simply haven't studied the glomeromycota in enough detail yet to understand these microscopic and molecular differences. One of the reasons for this, which I already kind of touched on earlier, is that it's pretty hard to grow these fungi in a lab. The glomeromycota have evolved such an integrated symbiosis with plants that they struggle to live without them. Thus, we can't really grow a single glomeromycot in a petri dish in a lab. We have to study them in symbiosis with a plant. Otherwise, they just die too fast. Alright, well, today's episode is going to be pretty short because I've basically covered all of the big details that we know about these things. But before I end the episode for good, I want to share one more cool fact with you about glomeromycot ecology. Alright, so we have this glomeromycota fungi, right? It's growing in the soil, it's uh, mycelium is creeping around, it's sniffing out plant exudates, and it's asexually producing spores. These asexual spores are generated and released relatively frequently and sometimes they can conglomerate together to form a larger structure. These structures are composed of many dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of spores, and the total volume makes this sporocarp macroscopic. You can see the sporocarp with your naked eye. It's a soft, nutritious lump of edible material, which makes it really appealing for small animals, especially burrowing creatures like rodents. They would uncover these spores and sporocarps as they dig around in the soil. The rodents eat the sporocarps, partially or in full, and then excrete the waste. Within the waste, portions of the sporocarp will still be intact. This is to say that there are spores who will survive the trip down the rodent's digestive tract, and they're now deposited back out into the world, back out into the soil, in a nugget of hot, nutrient-rich goo. This does two things that ecologically benefit the glomeromycota. First, the spores are now sitting in a very fertile environment. Germinating in a pile of poop is really good for a fungus, because animal poop is easy to break down and digest, so it's like an immediate food source for the young fungi. It's like fungal baby food. It's really no different than the wasps who lay their eggs inside spiders. The wasp eggs will hatch, and the young insects will eat the spider from the inside out. Except, in the case of the fungi growing out of animal waste, the poop isn't alive to feel the agony of being eaten from the inside out. Now the second thing is that the animal has moved the spores some distance away from where it was initially. The rodent, or whatever small animal it is, would find the sporocarp, and then they would eat it. And then sometime later, the rodent would have digested the sporocarp and excreted it as waste. But during that time interval, during this time gap between eating it and excreting it, you know, as the digestion is going on, the rodent is living its life. The rodent is moving around. It's still burrowing. It's still searching for more food. It's running away from predators. It's looking for a mate. It's doing all of this stuff that rodents do. And as it does so, naturally, it'll be moving around. It'll be running around the habitat. And this helps the glomeromycot 
because the rodent is basically spreading its seeds around and helping the fungal lineage colonize a wider area across geographic space. This is an example of an animal symbiosis with the Glomera mycota fungi that I just think is really cool. Like, it's really important, but it's also really cool. All right, well, with that, I think I can wrap it up. This has been a fun little episode on our journey through the fungal kingdom. And in the next two episodes, I'm going to cover the two most evolutionarily recent and the two largest clades of fungi. Episode 70 will explore the Ascomycota, or the Sac fungi. And the next episode, episode 71, will explore the Basidiomycota, which includes the traditional mushroom fungi, as well as conchs, puffballs, and a lot of other really weird stuff. And finally, the last episode in this series will be really exciting, because I'll be exploring the long and fascinating relationship that humans have with the fungal kingdom. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button. And if you're interested in all my content and you want to see all of these upcoming episodes, then hit the subscribe button so that you can catch them right when they get posted. Tell your friends about the podcast, consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, and as always, thanks for listening. Thank you.